I've got to tell you about something that happened in the film photography community that nobody expected. Back when film photography was among the biggest industries on the planet, companies like Kodak, Polaroid, and Fujifilm were monoliths that created tons of new technologies that made film and photography better, while also spawning new and exciting industries altogether from their multi-billion dollar R&D departments. But these behemoth companies didn't always play by the rules. They all fought plenty of battles in courtrooms protecting their intellectual property and defending their actions when they stole from others. In their hate Day, Kodak was one of the most litigious companies to ever exist, and the sums of money that they and others sought against them routinely hit record highs. The stakes back then were enormous. In fact, they were on par or greater than judgments against Facebook, Apple, Google, and Microsoft today. But since film almost disappeared, the film photography industry feels more collaborative than ever. And that's because what's keeping Kodak alive today is not exactly the ability to create film, but the ability for people to use it. Nobody would be shooting film if there weren't good cameras, chemistry, film scanners, or tools that make it possible to keep shooting film. That's why legacy manufacturers are happy to work with anyone who can help keep film around whether it's producing new products or repurposing films for a different process. And they'll even continue to work with these companies to refine their products after they've proven a market. Even if just a couple of decades ago, those indie producers would have been mortal enemies encroaching on Kodak's holy land. But while there are entrepreneurs creating new film products, very few have yet made film. And that's the holy grail. If you look deep into the mission statements of companies on podcasts and creator articles, and you'll find some dusty line somewhere saying that one day they'd love to make a new film stock. But so far, the only companies who have successfully brought new film to market without being a legacy manufacturer are Lomography and Film Washi. Others like Japan Camera Hunter have tried but they always run into roadblocks along the way because film was and still is one of the most difficult products on the planet to manufacture at scale. The machinery and expertise to cost effectively produce it just aren't around anymore. But there is a shortcut, and it's one that's becoming increasingly common right now. Many companies alter or rebrand film stocks that currently exist, and the current favorite route to bring film to market today is using Kodak Cinema Film. But this summer, something changed. At least something changed publicly. There have always been whispers about backdoor exclusive rights deals and creators running into man-made roadblocks forever, though nothing was concrete just yet. However, last year, a small part of that controversy finally reached the public. Cinestill, one of the largest companies selling Eastman Kodak film, sent notices to entrepreneurs around the world informing them that the altered cinema film that they were selling infringed upon their newly registered trademark for the term 800T. In those notices, Cinestill also claims the unregistered common law trademarks for 800 Tungsten and the variation T800 and even Cine when used in reference to photographic film. This was a strange move that took all of us by surprise. It stirred up a torrent of anger from the film community, and it's clear that Cinestill didn't expect this to go public, but the actions that they took were certain to stir the pot. So I had to ask, if Cinestill is spending the money to trademark the term 800T, and if it was worth risking the fallout, what exactly is Cinestill afraid of if that trademark doesn't exist? So today I'm going to take you on a deep dive of what is Cinestill and what they might be afraid of because there's a lot. This story goes a lot deeper than you might imagine. But before we get into all that, I have to tell you about my project, Soft Grain Books. Soft Grain Books is a small, independent, lens-based photo book publishing that was founded by myself and another international artist. We have a dream of publishing books and supporting independent artists around the world. Right now, we have a few of our own projects available and are in talks with a few other artists to make their work public in the next coming months. I want to show you Erosion of Spectacle right now by Sarah Faridaman. This is a fantastic street photography project showing how a single small event changed a public space into a spectacle. This book captures the event over the course of an entire year, watching the events unfold from start to finish. It's a fantastic project, and I am very proud to have this one on Soft Grain Books. I highly recommend checking it out using the link below. In doing so, will help support not only making these videos, but also help support other independent artists around the world. All right, and now let's get back to the story. 
This whole debacle started with a blog post by Cat Labs in October 2023, which made a false claim that they were being sued by Cinestill over listing Reflex Labs' then named 800T film. At least, if Cat Labs' claim of being sued were true, they weren't willing to provide any supporting documents other than Cinestill's cease and desist letter, which is just an official but non binding letter from lawyers saying, please stop. That blog post was the first time we'd learned that Cinestill trademarked 800T. Cat Labs obliged with the cease and desist letter and took down the offending Reflex Lab products. Reflex Lab also received their own cease and desist letter, demanding that they change the name of their then 800T product. And I just want to point out here that I don't think there was any malice involved in these statements. I just think that as soon as lawyers and laws are involved, things get needlessly complicated, and the tension just makes situations that are rife for misunderstandings. Once the post on Reddit gained traction, other companies said that they received the same messages from Cinestill, though it wasn't cease and desist letters, asking them to rebrand their film stocks to remove terms like 800T, 800, or 800 and tungsten, or T800, after their current film supply had run out. Cinestill also then filed takedown requests for the infringing film on platforms like eBay, Amazon, and Shopify, which caused some sellers to come dangerously close to having their long-standing businesses shut down overnight. The heart of the matter here is that the film community considers 800T to be a description of the film, and descriptions are strictly not trademarkable. For Cinestill to trademark 800T but not the film's actual name, 800 Tungsten, Cinestill must be afraid of something. To fully understand this, we have to go back to the beginning. Cinestill was started in 2012 by the Wright brothers, who were a couple of nerdy wedding photographers that loved using Kodak Cinema Film, especially 500T. They had a connection to a film lab in LA that still developed film using the ECN2 process, which at the time was on the verge of going extinct. But to do it effectively, they had to use really long rolls of film, not just your standard 36 exposure rolls, because a certain amount of the film had to be trimmed. So to do this, they had to use Nikon cameras with insane extended backs that could shoot up to 250 frames each, just like the photojournalists used to use. They wanted to save this film, which had a unique look that wasn't otherwise available to photographers who didn't have the same connections as them. That year, Kodak had just discontinued their final tungsten-balanced film photo emulsion, leaving behind nothing but daylight-balanced film for photographers, and the only remaining tungsten-balanced films for Hollywood where color balance matters a great deal more. 500T by Kodak is extremely useful for cinema. It's needed for capturing tricky lighting scenarios at night, in bars, or in otherwise moody atmospheres. The film isn't too grainy, but just grainy enough to have some character. But most importantly, Vision 3 500T is flexible for post-processing, especially when it's developed in Kodak's ECN2 developer, which creates a flatter or less contrasty negatives. Photographers can buy cinema film for cheap because of a thin remjet layer that's on the back. Remjet is an inky black carbon coating on the back of the film that blocks light and acts as a lubricant so the film strip doesn't heat up, build up static, or get caught inside the fast moving and expensive cinema cameras. Film tearing while running through a camera is one thing, but if the film heats up, wears down, or breaks down the machine, that would grind an expensive film production to a halt. Do you have a thousand dollars for me? What? Because each minute I spend talking to you, that's how much money I'm wasting. You can learn more about Remjet and film coatings in the video linked up around here somewhere. So the reason why cinema film isn't usually sold to photographers is because incorrectly handled ramjet is disastrous to film labs. If it's run through the C41 process that is used widely across the world instead of ECN2, that ramjet can gum up machines, it can ruin chemistry, and it can leave a splotchy mess of carbon embedded in the emulsions of all other film that's going through the processor, which could include other people's rules that the lab is now liable for. That's why you always need to properly label your film, because busy lab techs can't always physically check every single roll before it gets developed. 
Sinistil was the first company to solve the Remjet problem on an industrial scale. The Wright brothers were tinkerers who built their own machines to remove the Remjet from the film without causing too many defects like scratches, fog, or discoloration. Sinistil was able to reduce these defects by ensuring that their pre-removal process only removed the Remjet without touching the emulsion. They called their unpatented process pre-removal. The only difference is that after the remjet is removed, the film then shows distinct red halations around the highlights. Most people in Hollywood consider these halations to be a distracting flaw, but photographers took a liking to it. But best of all was the fact that the film could now be developed in the widely used C41 chemical process, which creates denser, more contrasty negatives than ECN2. That's how Cinestill is able to take Codex 500 ISO film and rate it at ISO 800. Needless to say, the film was a hit, and the Wright brothers did it during a time when the future of film was deeply uncertain. Sinistil had called their new film 800 Tungsten, for lack of a more interesting name. I'm not sure if they couldn't come up with a real trademarkable name like Portra, Gold, Street Pan, Acros, or if that was just another whiteboard task that they'd get to down the road. Burn. It's not a burn, it's cool. But 800T shooters in the early days will remember that Cinestill had problems. The negative sometimes came out blotchy with patches of color, static lightning marks, fog, or some other leftover remjet embedded in the emulsion. You can see this through old posts about the film on Reddit. But film photographers are addicts for chaos. And Cinestill was able to keep making their film for their dedicated audiences who would do anything to make sure another film choice didn't disappear. Eventually, as Cinestill got bigger, they were able to get a warehouse in Codex Rochester Business Park. And they also were able to amass a large sum of money through a successful crowdfunding campaign, promising to make 800T available in 120 format. This crowdfunding allowed them to have Kodak produce custom master rules for them. The founder said in a 2019 episode of the Kodakery podcast that today, Kodak literally rolls master rolls of the film down the hall to Cinestill's Rochester warehouse. That means Cinestill no longer needs to remove the Remjet manually, so no more mess to clean up and no defects, but most importantly, Cinestill can now produce the film in any format they want. 35mm, 120, large format, 110, 220, APS, disc. If there's a will, there's a way. And if some of those terms didn't make sense to you, the 90s were a wild time for new film formats that gave you less film for the same price. Before Cinestill's arrangement with Kodak, they were stuck making 35mm film only because 120 came with a lot of extra challenges that we'll get into later. And by working with Kodak, Cinestill can also add something like an anti-static layer to the back of the film, which reduces defects. And theoretically, they can also make minor changes to the emulsion. So Cinestill does make a novel product. Cinestill's film is as popular as it is today because it's the only reliable tungsten balanced high speed film on the market. The problem Cinestill faces today is that their old process is extremely replicable. Similar, if not the same process for removing Remjet, are published online on forums and on blogs, and there is a market that's hungry for high-speed film at a lower cost. And it's still relatively easy to satisfy that demand even in 2024. Here are the unit economics for selling cinema film if you ignore the ramjet removal process. According to Kodak's 2024 motion picture film sales brochure, linked in the description down below, Anyone can pick up a 1,000 foot roll of Codex Vision 3 500T film in 35mm format for $791.40 US. A 36 exposure roll is about 5 feet of film, meaning that if there's no waste, you can create 191 rolls of film, working out to about $4.14 per roll. You can buy reusable cassettes for $0.60 cents or a dollar each, and disposable canisters for about $0.10 cents each. That means it's pretty easy to get your cost as a seller down to about $6 or $6.50 per roll when you account for incidentals, and you could get set up to re-spool and sell film in your living room for less than $1,500 US. Of course, it's never quite that simple, and you can't underestimate the risk and complexity of removing the remjet for commercial sale. But the point is, the barrier to entry is not high, and demand is growing, especially when you consider that labs are starting to bring back the ECN2 process as demand for cinema film increases, thanks in part to Cinestill.
For a long time, this bulk-loaded ECN2 film was Cinestill's only real competition in the space. But because there weren't enough labs processing ECN2, the demand wasn't high enough to really bother Cinestill. Most people doing this were only making enough profit to support themselves or to just offset their own film costs. But over the last couple of years, at least a few factories have cropped up around the world that are now removing the Remjet as well and marking that film for C41 processing. The way Cinestill sees it, these companies are using the goodwill that Cinestill built to sell a generic dollar store product. Where did you get those clothes? At the toilet store? Cinestill thinks the other factories are at best copying them and at worst duping customers into paying for a bad product. When the whole debacle exploded on Reddit, Cinestill came out with a big response to talk about their side of the issue. Here's part of what they had to say. Last year, this is 2022 for context of this video, a wave of generic knockoff and counterfeit imitation products started popping up in China. We purchased samples and began testing them for market research. Some of them turned out to just be respooled leftover motion picture film, but a few proved to have their remjet removed prior to exposure. Our testing identified a range of issues including chemical contamination, remjet embedded into the emulsion, reduced film speed, and fogging. Although they were spooled in different 135 cassettes with different designs and materials used, the one thing these films had in common was damage in a pattern which signified they were all modified by the same source and concluded that they were from a single unknown origin. This statement got my attention. Any film made by another respooler could be considered a generic or knockoff film in Cinestill's mindset. That's honestly just part of good competition in any space. Because is the film community really being served that well if only Cinestill is selling Codex Vision 3 500T film? It feels petty. Like Cinestill thinks they should be the only ones allowed to do this simple process that they learned from a long line of people who were doing it before them. But claiming that there is counterfeit film out there is something different. So I went to the underbelly of the internet, the place where you go to buy cheaply made disposable and non-functional products. I went to AliExpress, Timu, and Amazon to see if I could find counterfeit film. And it's out there. On Amazon, there are white labeled films in reusable plastic canisters that are described as having 8, 12, or 18 shots. They're fairly inconspicuous, but to sell them, they actually use Fuji Instax photos with their roll photoshopped on top. It's actually kind of confusing and is probably meant to trick both film photographers and Instax users into buying the film. Though anyone with a sharp eye could easily see why it's not a good bargain. But more interestingly, there are film stocks that all mimic the Kodak plain yellow design, but with a reusable plastic canister and a sticker on the computer monitor, they're almost convincing. Again, if you even take a moment to look before clicking the buy now button, which they're obviously hoping you won't do, you'll notice the odd canister, the low exposure count, and the strange text on the canister like this one that says carbon free. And if you go to AliExpress, you can find similar counterfeit products pretending to be Cinestill 800T. The listing mimics the boxes almost perfectly, but you'd have to be pretty rich to not care about the price or the shipping time. It's a scam. Why would someone want to scam me and on the internet service, one of the trusted things of today's society? The thing is though, if it's not obvious that this isn't a scam, what is obvious is that it's expensive. Probably far more expensive than buying film at your local retailer. And that's true even for Canadians. My 18-shot roll of carbon-free cinema film cost $20, where I could buy a Kodak-branded 36 exposure roll of the same film for $16.50. But that fact alone doesn't mean that these won't sell. Looking at the reviews, it appears that at least a few people have bought the 8 exposure roll, only to get just 5 shots before it wouldn't advance any further. Oh god, you got screwed. Oh my god. <laughs> But if this is what Cinestill is afraid of, what does trademarking solve? Realistically, they could take down any film listing that was pretending to be Cinestill long before the official trademark. And obviously, the trademark isn't stopping a single one of these bad actors from listing on Amazon, and even less so on Timu or AliExpress. A trademark is a sharp tool that solves a very particular problem. Drilling down further into Cinestill's 2023 statement on the trademark, they said, Our concerns were that the usage of 800T to identify other products would lead to confusion for the consumer, which is the basic definition of actionable trademark infringement. 
with dissatisfied consumers, justifiably but incorrectly, leveraging complaints about 800T and wrongly associating them with Cinestill's 800T film. Similarly, if a lab were to accept a roll of 800T film from another manufacturer who hadn't properly removed the Remjet from the motion picture film, causing damage to their processing machines, processing becomes less accessible to the greater community and damages Cinestill's reputation and business. But let's not be kidding here. No lab worth their salt would ever refuse to develop Cinestill film out of fear that it still has Remjet. That hasn't been an issue for Cinestill for over five years now, and the generics would be extremely easy for a lab tech to pick apart even with the lights off because every generic film I saw listed, including the one that I bought, used a reusable plastic canister that had a sticker label. Authentic films from Kodak, Fuji, Ilford, and Cinestill all use aluminum canisters with dye sublimated labels. If it was your first week on the job and you'd never shot film, yeah, maybe you could miss it. But even then, nobody blames Gucci when the knockoff zipper tears. And I just want to point out something funny about the damage patterns that Cinestill described. These are all problems that Cinestill used to exhibit before working with Kodak. But despite these problems, Cinestill still became a big company. Sure, they say they're only a small team of just 12 people, and on paper that is probably true. But the reality is they do employ a lot of workers indirectly. From the people supplying raw materials to workers at Kodak who make the film to the people in Europe who are finishing the film into canisters or 120 rolls, and all the people down the supply chain, chances are there are a lot of people who are employed because of Cinestill's input. And if Cinestill were to actually create their own film in their own factory and finish it in their own factory, they would need a much larger team. They just have a small 12-person marketing team. So if Cinestill could make it from being a scrappy underdog with a relatively unreliable film in 2013 to having a globally distributed product, that means there's room for competition. But no competition will make it unless they can offer a similar product at a lower price. That's the magic formula. And despite Cinestill's best efforts, it's starting to happen. Let's take a look at one of Cinestill's competitors here that has made a remarkable progress stepping on Cinestill's holy land. This news brought a lot of attention to manufacturers like Grain, Film, Candido, Amber, and Reflex Lab. Grain, Candido, and Amber all offer the same Remjet Removed Vision 3 film, but with a higher price than Cinestill. I can go on B&H right now and still buy a roll of Amber T800, even though Cinestill is claiming the T800 common law trademark, and many believe that that's because Cinestill wouldn't dare try to fight B&H. Though, I personally believe B&H would rather side with Cinestill. The thing that doesn't get mentioned is Cinestill gave manufacturers the ability to sell their remaining film stock before changing the packaging. This was a sign of goodwill to make sure that they didn't saddle retailers and producers with a ton of costs and waste, which was a nice move. So my theory here is this. Amber T800 offers film in 27 exposure rolls that cost just 50 cents less than Cinestill in 36 exposure rolls. That means each exposure for 800T is 46 cents, where Amber T800 costs 59 cents. Unless you really hate Cinestill, you're not going to pay a premium for what could be a lower quality product. And B&H doesn't deal in niche products. They're all about volume. So I think the reason why to this day you can still buy Amber T800, and this could change by the time this video is published, despite Cinestill's claim, is because Amber T800 is not selling that well. But one company stands out against all the other respoolers that were affected by Cinestill's trademark, and that's Reflex Lab. They're one of the only companies that respools Vision 3 film in 120 format, and they do it for the same price as a roll of Kodak Ultramax. What's impressive about this is medium format film is so much harder to respool. Here's one of these rolls. This is IMAX film that has been cut down to 120 format. IMAX is about 4 millimeters wider than 120 and has sprocket holes. That means respoolers first need to cut down the film just outside of the sprocket holes to fit a medium format spool. Cutting along the sprocket holes is very difficult for a machine to keep straight, but then the end consumer has odd little holes on the edges of the film that they have to contend with. It's not the end of the world, but it is something you have to consider. But then the second problem is the backing paper. 120 film doesn't come with a lightproof canister, so it has to be physically attached to a piece of non-recyclable lightproof backing paper. But lightproof backing paper is a specialized product that isn't available off the shelf. 
So home respoolers often use recycled backing paper, which will never be as perfect, and it has the potential to get mixed up in the lab if they read the info on the backing paper instead of on the label that Reflex Lab supplies you to secure the paper once the roll is finished. If you lose this paper, which does happen, you'll need to use tape, and if you don't label it properly, you can single-handedly shut down a film lab because the backing paper is from another film that is likely meant for C41 processing. I've personally now seen Kodak Portra 800, Portra 400, Fuji 400 film, and I've even seen Kodak Ektar, so it's really up to chance what you're gonna get. And it's not likely that it's going to be ECN2 because there's never really been an ECN2 film that's been in 120 format. So that's just not going to happen. Though to be fair, most lab techs are probably going to feel the jaded sprocket holes on the edges of the film, which should be a dead giveaway that something is up when they remove the film from the backing paper for the first time. These problems put into perspective why it was such a big deal for Cinesteel to be able to sell their 800T film in medium format. Before them, nobody even attempted it on a commercial scale. And it's not likely that Reflex Lab will ever be able to offer Remja Remove Cinema Film at Cinesteel's scale without striking a similar deal with Kodak to get the master rolls of the film. That said, Reflex Lab already has Kodak Aero Color in 120, 35 millimeter, 220 format, and even large format at cheaper prices than Cinesteel. That means that Reflex Lab is probably on the precipice of being able to get master rolls from Kodak. That is, so long as Cinestill hasn't gone on and already made a backdoor exclusivity deal with Kodak. So here's the thing, if Cinestill is truly afraid of other film manufacturers popping up like Reflex Labs and affecting their reputation, Cinestill has two options. Either they compete on price using their larger size, brand image, connections, established marketing, and their robust distribution channels to outcompete the smaller companies, or they can simply sidestep and try to remove the competition from the market. You make me so mad. What are you going to do about it? I'll take it. Here you go. On May 10, 2021, Cinestill chose to file a trademark in the United States for the term 800T. This is an interesting move because the actual name for Cinestill 800T is 800 Tungsten with no space and a capital T. Look on Wikipedia, their website, marketing materials, and everywhere else, it's 800 Tungsten first, with 800T mentioned sometimes in the text. But we all call it 800T for brevity. In fact, I don't think I've ever had a conversation where somebody has actually called the film 800 Tungsten. Now, trademarks are essential in commerce. Trademarks are the reason why you can buy a bottle of Coca-Cola and know it won't taste like Pepsi. This Coke tastes like Pepsi. That knowledge, called goodwill, is based on advertising and time in the market. Trademarks are also the reason you know your HP branded printer will probably run out of ink and refuse to print faster than the competition. Nobody said established goodwill was always good. When your company trademark gets approved, no other company can use your distinctive mark, logo, coined phrase, smell, branded color, or distinctive accent to sell an inferior product that could ruin your hard-earned reputation. Unless your brand is HP, in which case a knockoff would probably improve the reputation. But joke's on them because nobody wants to knock off HP. But trademarks are only supposed to be awarded for distinctive attributes. You specifically cannot trademark descriptive terms or features like the term glossy for your paper or oil for your paint. Because if that happened, every company would have to come up with a new proprietary term for products that do the same thing. Just think of how difficult it would be to choose the right materials for your project if Epson, Canon, Fuji, Ilford, and Kodak all had different names for the term glossy paper. That is a dark timeline that I don't want to live in. There's already nebulous terms out there like luster, pearl, and satin that make it difficult enough to choose. I can't take it, Jerry. It's too much. It's too much. And this is where it gets tricky. Nearly all film photographers know the 800T format is description of the film's properties. If you see 800T on a package, you will know it's an ISO 800 film balanced for tungsten light. Meanwhile, 250D is an ISO 250 film balanced for daylight. This is the format that Kodak and Fuji have used for their film lineup since at least the late 80s, probably earlier. That's as far back as I was able to find on the internet, though. 
And astute viewers of this controversy will already know that 800T was once a description for Kodak's Vision 800T film that was discontinued back in 2004. Kodak never trademarked that term, though even if they did, it hasn't been used in commerce for over 20 years now, so that trademark would be easily overturned. But Cinestill considers 800T to be part of the brand name of their film. They didn't make an original name like Portra, Superior, Ektar, or Lomo 92. Kodak's 500T film is actually branded and trademarked as Kodak Vision 3, which is used for their lineup of cinema films that use the descriptive 500T text, so creators can know and choose the right film for their project. That's why Cinestill's mark was originally denied by the ruling trademark attorney on January 10th, 2023. The attorney said, Cinestill's mark merely describes a feature of the applicant's goods. But like any company, Cinestill appealed this ruling, claiming that 800T had become distinctive, no longer descriptive, because of Cinestill's five years of sole marketing, production, and worldwide distribution of 800 tungsten film. The trademark attorney approved that argument and awarded the trademark after posting the notice of trademark in the Trademark Official Gazette, or TMOG, without any opposition for more than two months. Most people would have never expected this trademark to be granted, but let's just put this into context. In 2021 alone, there were 940,000 trademark applications. That's 36,305 trademarks per working day. But in the USA, there are just 600 attorneys working at the US Trademark Office. That means every trademark attorney needs to approve or deny eight trademarks per hour just to keep up. And that's not even factoring in lunch or bathroom breaks. That's seven and a half minutes to research and assess whether a trademark should be granted, not to mention doing the paperwork that goes along with it. So it's no wonder a 2018 study in Duke Law, which is linked below, found that there's very little in the way of standardized scrutiny in the trademark offices. Some could just be automatically approved to get the application into the done file, because the only thing worse than having to deal with 64 trademarks a day is having half of them come back to your desk months later with slight modifications. The only recourse here is to file an opposition to the trademark before it's granted, which means sifting through the TMOG, a fun government database of roughly 20,000 approved trademarks posted each week. If you don't have prior knowledge of a filing, you will be very hard-pressed to ever catch a trademark and file an opposition, especially for a term that Kodak, one of the most trademark and patent-hungry companies to ever exist, didn't think to register. So what does this mean now? Now that Cinecil owns that trademark, they want you to know that they're in a bit of a bind. They want you to know that they have to defend it. Because just like your favorite appendages, if you don't use it, you lose it. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. A trademark can also become generic if other companies start using it, which then allows anyone to do whatever they want with that trademark. That's why Google doesn't want you to say Google it when you search on Bing, and why Xerox created a major international campaign to get people to say make a photocopy rather than make a Xerox. If a trademark term becomes indistinguishable from the brand, no matter how big that brand is, they can lose their trademark. And if Xerox lost their trademark, HP could have then made their own Xerox machine watering down both brands at once. Burn. But the lawyer made me do it argument is a generous way of talking about Sinistil's actions here. This is a way of assuaging guilt, as if it's not their fault because they're being forced by the evil lawyers who they're choosing to keep paying. And that's the thing with lawyers. You can stop paying them and they will stop giving you that advice that you don't like and just go away. You're a terrible family lawyer. And a selfish lover, I bet. But another interesting thing about this whole story is that Cinestill is not just going after companies using 800T in their branding of their film. They're also going after companies using T800 and 800 tungsten whether there's a space or not. And they're threatening to even go after the term Cine. Cinestill claims the variations are common law trademarks instead of regulated trademarks, and that variations of their trademark will lead to confusion among buyers. Common law trademarks, denoted by the letters TM, aren't registered with the government and are only maintained within local jurisdictions on a first used, first claimed basis. For example, In N Out Burger has a menu item called a double double, which means something radically different to all the Canadians who all immediately perked up at the thought of an outrageously caffeinated Tim Hortons coffee with two creams and two sugars. The double double is so ingrained in the Canadian raison d'etre that I instinctively capitalized it in my script, and it's basically a question on the citizenship test. What is this?
is an ad for Tim Hortons in Canada. Both Tim Hortons and In-N-Out Burger have advertised the Double Double, but in different markets. That means if In-N-Out came to Canada, they would not be able to sell a Double Double under that name anywhere in the country. And Tim Hortons would not be able to sell a Double Double in any of the US states where In-N-Out Burger existed first. But Tim Hortons could sell their Double Double in any state east of Colorado because In-N-Out has not established that common law term in those markets. So by claiming 800 Tungsten, T800, and Cine as common law trademarks and 800T as a registered trademark, Cinestill is attempting to be the only company that can sell film using any form of 800 and T or 800 and Tungsten, and even Cine. They are trying to dominate those search terms so that if you search for 800 Tungsten or Cine film on Google, Amazon, B&H, eBay, Etsy, or even your local camera store's website, you will only see Cinestill film and not any of the films that Cinestill considers are using confusingly similar terms. And if you list your film using those terms, even in the tags or hashtags on any of those marketplaces, Cinestill can use their trademark to file a takedown request that stops those films from even existing on the internet altogether. That's a really powerful piece of paper in Cinestill's back pocket, because as an indie producer of film, you just can't fight that. But here's the important thing. A trademark is a sharp tool that stops just one thing. Another company using a string of characters to label their product. If Cinestill is afraid of other respoilers eating their lunch, a trademark isn't going to solve that problem. Just merely slow it down. The trademark is not going to stop manufacturers from rebranding Kodak Cinema Film, and it's definitely not going to stop overseas factories from flooding the market with generic or deceptive films. Cinestill did not and could not send a cease and desist letters or flag listings for Remjet removed 500T products that use a completely different trade name or the ones that just use ISO 800 on the package with tungsten somewhere in the description. For example, if you did the exact same process and called your film Nighthawk 800 and called it a tungsten balance cinema film, you would not be getting a cease and desist letter or takedown notice from Cinestill, which Jason or Caleb, if you're watching this, you can totally just have that. Now, this is purely speculation on my part, but I believe that by asserting this common law trademark over terms like T800 Cine and 800 Tungsten now, Cinestill is gearing up to register 800 Tungsten, 400 Dynamic, 400D, and probably the word Cine. Though they won't be trademarking 50D or X since Kodak sells their film stocks under the exact same names. Because that's just Cinestill being, to put it nicely, relaxed with their naming practices. So? So that's against the rule, and you can't sit with us. Whatever. Those rules aren't real. The fact that these marks are considered descriptive text by film photographers is likely why Cinestill chose to call their 400D film 400 Dynamic. Cinestill's March 22nd, 2022 400D announcement was when they started seriously changing the messaging around their film. That was the first time many of us noticed they claimed their films were proprietary, never before seen emulsions, with unique characteristics, and not at all based on Vision 3 film. I personally was taken aback by this because I'd heard Cinestill admit that their film was Vision 3 film many times in the past. The tactic of claiming their film is unique is not new for Cinestill. They say the same thing about their CS41 Color Simplified Chemical Kits, which they claim is a unique formula that they crafted to last longer than the competition. But if you've ever used an Arista, Tetanol, or Unicolor C41 Blix kit, they all come with the same boxes, with the same chemicals, in the same bottles, with the same rated capacity, and even the same set of instructions with the same wording. The only difference is that Cinestill's instructions are in color and the others are in black and white. So either Cinestill copied those companies down to the type of plastic they used to contain the liquids and sealing that they used for the bottles, or they're licensing the kit from another company. That's Cinestill for you. They're making big claims about making unique products, but they do not go very far to cover their tracks. But looking back, Cinestill's film messaging changed just after their trademark application for 800T was denied on January 10th, 2022. They must have changed it, hoping that 400D will be easier to trademark if they can prove the big D doesn't stand for what you think it does. 
Sinistil can file a trademark at any time, but if it fails the first round like 800T did, they will have to wait until early 2027 to use the five years of sole use clause, which they probably don't want to do because you can already see other films being listed as 400D film stocks online, which is bad news for Sinistil's sole use argument. The other thing that I think Sinistil is afraid of is, surprisingly, the ECN2 process, which the film Sinistil markets is natively designed for. I honestly couldn't tell you if there's a real difference in cinema emulsions versus photofilm emulsions. So if there are any photo engineers in the chat watching this video, please leave a comment down below and I'll highlight it for everyone to see. But when you look into ECN2 though, you'll notice that Cinestill spends a weird amount of time telling people not to use it for cinema film. The Wright brothers authored a deep dive on the Emulsive blog, which is linked below, where they pit ECN2 against C41. They wrote at length about how dangerous the chemicals are, how ECN2 produces negatives that have less contrast, and how it's just not good for making RA4 color prints, of which maybe 1% of you watching will ever even consider doing anyways. And then if you ignore the blog post and go buy ECN2 chemicals on the Sinistil website, more than half of the text on their sales page and in their instruction manual tries to convince you that ECN2 is dangerous. How Sinistil is protecting you and after all that, why ECN2 just isn't the right solution. They probably spend more time telling you not to buy it in their sales page than actual words that are telling you what it does or why it's worthwhile to use. Sinistil also made sure that their ECN2 kit doesn't have a separate pre-bath for removing Remjet. They claim that their kit has a combined developer and pre-bath formula, which requires the user to use one-shot developing rather than reuse if they're developing films that have Remjet. Of course, they don't give instructions on how to use the kit one shot, not to mention the fact that powder developer kits are bad for one shot developing since there's no guarantee the active ingredients are evenly spread out throughout the powder. You can of course get around this by making your own pre-bath, for which there are a number of recipes online that will cost you less than a couple dollars for a liter of solution. But this ECN2 format means Sinistil is either inexplicitly expecting you to only use their kit with their ramjet removed film, or they're making sure that you're going to have to pay more and do more work if you develop the other guy's cinema films. Because if you reuse the kit with ramjet backed film, you will get ramjet in the emulsions of every film you develop develop in the solution thereafter. Luckily, there are other players in the ECN2 market, like Flick Film, who make a kit with a pre-bath. Now, the Occam's Razor answer here would be that the Sinistil founders just don't like ECN2 for photofilm, and that's honestly fair. They built their empire on C41. C41 is kind of like using your cell phone or taking photos with a film simulation. The images come out looking good from the start, where ECN2 is like taking a photo in raw format. At first, the images are ugly, colorless, and kind of lack contrast, but that lack of contrast means that there's more room for the photographer to interpret the colors and light as they wish. ECN2 negatives aren't as dense, they need more light, and honestly, they do take more work and more exposure to look good. If you're not ready for that, then you probably won't like the results that you get from ECN2 chemistry. But it feels like Cinestill doesn't ever want ECN2 to become popular, and you can clearly see that they were bashing a competitor's product in that emulsive article. I also wish Cinestill didn't try to sabotage cinema film photographers by making an ECN2 kit without the pre-bath and actively discouraging its use because there are going to be some cases where that process legitimately creates better images than C41. But Sinistil is setting their customers up for failure, and it's not fair. So I'm coming back to this from the editing desk to add just one more point. I'd originally cut this one out because it's a bit of a conspiracy theory, but the more that I've thought about this whole story holistically, the more that this one thing just makes sense. If you have any competing theories, I'd love to see it in the comments down below. But here it is. Sinistil's weakness and their largest asset is their worldwide supply chain. It's astronomically complex and it's the one thing that nobody can compete with. Yet it's also probably a big reason why they can't grow much further than they are right now. Sinistil could be trademarking their assets to gear up for investors to improve their supply chain or even to sell the company altogether. The Wright brothers have been running Sinistil for over 10 years now, and the next stages of growth for Sinistil are probably out of scope for the company in its current state. 
I bet the Wright brothers are already high earners, but they've built a company worth millions. And I can only imagine the thought of cashing out is quite attractive to them right now. But for investors, there's not a whole lot that's concrete. Sinistil now owns some of their IP. Again, they legitimately can't get 50D or double X and maybe not even 400D, but they don't own the means of production for their own product, just the supply chain. As well, their cost of sending the film overseas to be finished into 135 canisters comes at an astronomical cost. Building the machines to finish the film themselves, I'm quite sure is out of their league right now. But finishing the film themselves is what they have to do if they want to grow. Because film can only get so expensive before people just stop buying it. Kodak and Lomography, for example, recently had to cut costs on their 120 film. Lomography said cutting costs of 120 was because they didn't want the medium to become extinct. And that's why you can now actually buy Lomo 800 in medium format for less than half the cost of 35mm. And the crazy thing is that it's the same amount of film. A roll of 120 film has the same surface area as a 36 exposure roll of 35mm film. So the prices here do not reflect the cost of production, but instead they reflect the demand. And if you look at Cinestill 800T on B&H, there's often some medium format rolls that are being discounted because they're expired or expiring. These products have a shelf life of two years, and it wasn't that long ago that Cinestill could hardly keep the product on the shelves. So this tells me that there is in fact a defined limit on the cost of film before it gets abandoned altogether. So for Cinestill to grow, they cannot raise their prices, especially when you can get three rolls of Lomo 800 for less than two rolls of Cinestill. And on the other side of the coin, there are only so many film stocks that Cinestill can release before that extra complexity costs them more than the extra selection is worth. For example, according to a local film retailer, 400D is not selling very well and isn't likely to continue, which funnily enough is exactly as the Wright brothers predicted in a 2019 interview on the Kodakery podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, but, yeah. But, no, no, it's good. Uh, to get out of the way for any of those listeners who want us to release a 250D or something, because it's conceptual, we could do it. Yeah. Portra's great. Buy yeah. Portra. Yeah. 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 Like, right, right. Why would you want Portra with... That has nailed. photos. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun, but in the end, Portra's already nailed. That. They're using the Vision 3 technology in Portra. It's not the same as 250D, but they've already nailed the daylight balanced color negative film. Yeah, <laughs> right, in right. my opinion. Just buy that. <laughs> yeah, and it's just going to be a lot easier, and we want to keep sales volume up for Kodak as well mm -hmm. on the products they make, not just try to split the market. Yeah, yeah, something that exactly. looks almost the same. Yeah. No, but we found the unique film stocks in motion that we shot, that our favorite, was the tungsten balanced, high speed tungsten balanced, and the low speed fine grain daylight balanced film, yeah. which is 50D. So 800T and 50D, these, these are the two film stocks that we make because they stand out. Mm -hmm. They're not like other stocks that are existing. So that's the ones we're gonna make. Yeah. I mean, but if you want us to make other ones, we are open to the suggestions, but it's not likely. If, if it compares to something that already exists, we're not really interested. So that's interesting. So you're, you're trying to go for, again, the niche. Creating niche products that rot on the shelf costs Cinestill, their supply chain, and retailers money. The way for Cinestill to grow would be to control their own film finishing line. They can't produce their own film. It is so difficult to do that in the modern age, and especially at the quality and at the capacity that Cinestill needs right now and their, their customers expect. So the logical path for Cinestill's growth is to bring in investors who can help with the upfront cost of building their own machines to package the film. Before now, Cinestill mostly raised money through their local connections and through crowdfunding. But crowdfunding works when you want to bring a new product to the market, but not when you're raising capital to improve profitability. For that kind of investing, you really need an organization with deep pockets that sees a viable long-term business. So that's where I'm betting my money. Either the Wright brothers are looking for an exit or they're trying to take their company to the next level and securing that trademark of 800T and the other ones is honestly the bare minimum for them to look legit in the eyes of investors. And they honestly royally f***ed that up from the start. Don't take business lessons from Sinistil. Don't do it. You'll regret it, man. Trust me. So what's next? When I started this video, I didn't want to make the same generic arguments that I saw everyone else making because there was a lot of anger around this trademark 
And some of it is certainly justified. And on one hand, Sinistil has a lot to be afraid of. Sinistil's supply chain is probably the weakest part of their business because they simply can't finish the film themselves. They have to send it across the pond to Europe just to have most of the film shipped back again, which increases their costs exponentially. Kodak could also decide any day that they want to keep those cinema film profits for themselves and release Kodak Vision 4 to photographers for a lower cost than Cinestill can. Cinestill is also facing some real competition. I'm just going to say it again. What Reflex Lab is doing must be scaring the pants off the Wright brothers right now. They're selling cinema film in 35mm and medium format for much cheaper than Cinestill, both with and without Remjet. They've also started selling film in both large format and 220 format, which they achieved before Sinistil without crowdfunding over $750,000 to do it. The one-upmanship by Reflex Lab is incredible, and I'm here for it. Reflex Lab has proven that they're ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sinistil, and I bet it's only a matter of time before you see their film on local store shelves. But there also are some scammy sellers out there. And just because a film is sold on Amazon doesn't mean it's high quality. It is a, it's not even a scheme per se. It's, I have to go make a call. It's always possible for screw ups to happen, which can harm a film lab. A little leftover remjet isn't likely going to be an issue, but a full roll would be. With all this pressure from the competition, it makes sense to me that Cinestill would try to protect their reputation and market share. Kodak, Fuji, Ilford, and Polaroid have all done this before, but the trademark is not going to solve any of Cinestill's real problems. Not a single one of the companies that got a letter from Cinestill stopped selling Kodak Cinema film. I don't think Cinestill's mistake was trademarking 800T. Nearly every company in their position would do the same thing. I think Cinestill's mistake was being too lazy to give their film a real name and then time and time again making the same mistake. They should have come up with something unique. That's just basic business here. And because of this, I think Cinestill is actually in a very fragile position with this trademark. They likely will avoid going to court at all costs because they know deep down that if their trademark is challenged by someone who has more than seven minutes to decide on the validity of the mark, there's a real chance they'll lose. From here on out, their actions to maintain their trademark's goodwill might just be what undoes the actual goodwill in the end. Customer sentiment for Cinestill has fallen precipitously, even if you no longer see it on Reddit or Instagram like you once did and their competition got a lot stronger because of it. That said, I think the other manufacturers who also make Remjet removed film are going to be in some trouble. They likely had a nice boost to their bottom lines when this whole debacle happened. But the thing is, if your film costs $23 plus shipping for a 36 exposure roll, I'm going to save $6.50 and just buy a Cinestill. And I'm sure that's the same even for the most ardent haters of Cinestill right now. If I have one recommendation for all cinema film producers out there, it would be to start promoting ECN2 processing by making home kits or making your own standalone Remjet pre-bath solution so the film can be developed in C41. That's the biggest hurdle that photographers face when they buy your film right now. Solve that and you'll make more sales. But it's undeniable that Cinestill created a great product. Whether or not you like the film or the halations is personal preference. But they built something that would not have existed otherwise, and they did it at a time when the future of film was deeply uncertain. They took a big risk, and it paid off for everyone in the community. All right, so that's all for today. This was a pretty complicated video, so I put tons of links in the description for further reading. If you notice that any of them don't work in the future, maybe the articles got taken down, just let me know in the comments below, and I will link another version for you. Will you continue buying Cinestill film after this? Let me know down in the comments below. And of course, be sure to check out the sponsor of today's video, Softgrain Books. Every purchase there helps me keep making videos like this while also supporting independent photographers just like you. We've got some incredible projects that are coming out and I'm super excited to show them to you. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. In Nico's Photo News, episode 249, he said Cinestill was still removing the Remjet from film, and that the tell is the oval shapes in the sprocket holes. So I'm going to show you guys a comparison between Cinestill 800T, Fuji 400, and a Remjet removed color film. Fuji 400 is a C41 color film, never intended for video, and you can see that the sprocket holes here are pretty square. 
This carbon-free film that is meant to look like Kodak Ultramax or gold does have the circular egg-shaped patterns on the sprocket poles that Nico described. But the Cinestill film here looks exactly the same as the Fuji film. So that's another reason, along with the Kodakery podcast episode, where I'm nearly 100% certain that Cinestill is not removing the Remjet anymore. Because it's honestly impossible to get as close to perfect as their film is with while removing the Remjet. And they just could not make 120 film the way they are unless they're getting it from the factory without the Remjet. Don't leave me here.